If you know what to expect when you're embarking on a longer fast, it's a lot easier to stick with it. You're much less likely to quit, right? So this video is all about the common side effects that you'll experience while you are doing a longer fast, like 24, 36 hours plus. Okay, it's pretty common to notice these. And the interesting thing is when you look at the large pools of data and you categorize the severity of side effects, you find that most side effects for people that are doing longer fast are categorized into what is called the AE1 category, which are very, very mild side effects. And then you have the AE2, which are a little less mild, all the way up to AE5, which is like the worst, like considering death. Okay, when you look at the big pools of data, you don't see people in the AE5 category, at least in this particular study. You see people in the AE1, AE2. Point in me saying that is, it's common to feel these side effects, so don't be alarmed. But also know when it's too much. If you start feeling completely incapacitated, you feel like these are way too much, then yeah, you should call it quits. Okay, but anyway, let's go ahead and break it down. The first one is a common one. It's getting a headache. And you probably expect that I would have said this, but I wanna outline something. Okay, pain does not mean that there is a pathological issue. Okay, we also have to look at how sensitive we become to pain. When we are fasting, our pain threshold drops quite a bit. There's a study that was published in the journal Psychophysiology that took a look at 32 women, and it had them do about a 36 hour fast. They fasted from the morning one day to the evening the next day. And they found that their pain threshold and their pain tolerance significantly diminished by the end of the fast. Now, there's some reasoning behind this, and I'll explain it. There's something called the sympathovagal balance, okay? And what this is, is when we get into what is called the sympathetic nervous system, which is when we are stressed out because we're fasting, we're not eating, so our body's under a little stress, we are no longer in the parasympathetic nervous system. Well, when we are not in that parasympathetic mode, it ends up changing our pain tolerance. So I want you to imagine this. Let's say you are super, just you're stressed out, you're irritated, kids are yelling at you, all this stuff's going on. Then you stub your toe. That stubbing your toe is gonna hurt a lot more when you're irritated and when you're frustrated and you're stressed, right? But if you were calm, cool, collected, everything was good, you'd stub your toe and you'd be like, ah, okay, that hurt, but you'd roll, roll with it a little bit more. Pain threshold plays a big role. And I'm not saying that your headache is only there because you're sensitive to pain right now. The headache is a real thing because the hypoglycemic effect, like you're not used to this, your blood sugar is a little bit lower, the dehydration effect, the headaches are absolutely real and they happen. They tend to balance out as you get used to fasting, but when you first start fasting especially, they are just exacerbated because your pain tolerance is less. It's interesting though, because if you look at other data, you find that blood glucose is correlated with pain threshold. Lower levels of blood glucose also were associated with lower pain threshold and lower pain tolerance in other studies. But I think a really big piece that we have to look at, and I know I'm spending a lot of time on this one, but it's important. When you are fasting, your insulin levels are lower because you don't have glucose, as much glucose coming in, right? Your insulin levels are lower, which means less protein synthesis. What that means is you have less tryptophan available. So you have more of what are called large neutral amino acids, large chunks of amino acids that are occupying the transport into the brain. And that is making it so that tryptophan cannot get into the brain. So if tryptophan can't get into the brain, tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin, which is the feel-good neurotransmitter. So it's common to feel a little bit anxious, uncomfortable when you're fasting, and you can't really pinpoint why. But additionally, serotonin is also correlated with our pain threshold. When serotonin levels are high and we feel good, pain threshold is higher. When serotonin is lower because of less tryptophan, pain threshold is lower. So again, it all adds up, which leads me into my next one, dehydration. Okay, it may make sense that you're just consuming water in a fast so you get hyperhydrated. There's two things working against you. One, about 30% of the fluid that we get in in a given day is coming from food. So 30% right off the top gone. You already need to add 30% more water. But then we have another situation. The more that we hydrate without other food and minerals coming in, the more that we actually dehydrate ourselves because our kidneys are expelling extra water when our insulin levels are low. So the more water we drink, we actually dehydrate ourselves more. So does that mean that you shouldn't drink water? No, it means that you really do wanna consider adding salt or adding electrolytes during a longer fast. Because dehydration, if you look at a study that was published in the journal Nutrition Review, is pretty broad scale, physical like, decline, per physical performance decline, cognitive performance decline. If you start feeling, I do not feel like myself, outside of just feeling hypoglycemic, and you just feel lethargic and weak, 
it very well could be a mineral sodium water thing. Okay, I put a link down below for my favorite electrolytes that I use when I'm fasting. That link gets you eight free sample packs of what is called Element. That's my favorite electrolyte. So they're down below eight free sample packs. You just pay a couple bucks for shipping. So again, eight sample packs of Element that you can try when you're fasting or when you're working out or whatever. You just pay five bucks for shipping. So that link is down below in the description or you can go to drink lmnt.com. Again, drink lmnt.com slash Thomas, or just use that link down below and you can try them out. See if you like them. If you want to keep using them, then absolutely. There you go. But at least this way you can try them out. So that link is down below and a big thank you to Element for the sponsorship and support on this channel. Next one is called orthostatic hypotension, which is a really scary sounding name, but it basically means you get dizzy when you stand up. Or if you were to like suddenly start walking from a standstill, you might get a little bit dizzy or feel foggy or lightheaded. Very normal, very common thing. There was a study that was published in the journal Manipulative and Physiological Therapeutics that took a look at a longer fast. In this particular case, it was 10 and a half days. I'm not saying you're going to go do that, but my point is still the same. After 10 days, they found that blood pressure decreased just chronically from by 37 over 13 millimeters of mercury. So that is a huge decrease in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. What that tells us is, yes, there is a benefit there, but I'm not saying you're going to go treat all your issues with this. That's not my point. My point is with dehydration, with less glucose, with fasting in general, you can have sort of an acute bout of orthostatic hypotension where your body doesn't have enough salt, doesn't have enough fluid to the point where when you move suddenly, you can't adjust blood pressure. Like if you were sleeping and then stood up, your blood pressure would probably change, right? Because all of a sudden you have to adjust and pump more blood. So this is a very important thing. And people get really freaked out when they experience this because they're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm super dizzy. I got to eat something. When in reality, it's a hydration thing and it's a salt thing, and it's a somewhat normal thing. So I would, once again, recommend adding some salt in, hydrating up, but only in the presence of salt, and don't overhydrate. Another thing that you can absolutely expect is some sleeplessness, but also feeling kind of restless, okay? Now, some of it has to do, again, with the tryptophan thing that I talked about. Some of it has to do with just being in the sympathetic nervous system. There's a study that was published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition that demonstrated that fasting absolutely does increase cortisol levels associated with stress. And then we know from other studies that cortisol affects sleep. Okay, well, that's a pretty straightforward thing, but there's more going on than just that with fasting. Fasting increases the gene expression of what are called orexin neurons, orexins, okay? So these orexin neurons are associated with wakefulness. And they're also closely tied in with our metabolism. So when we're not eating, we have more stimulation of orexins, which just stimulate wakefulness. They make us feel awake. They can make us feel restless even when we aren't like trying to sleep. They can just make us feel kind of weird. They also interact very much so with our sympathetic nervous system. So our fight or flight response. When we're fasting, that fight or flight response, of course, is triggering stress response and catecholamines and stress hormones, sure but it's also indirectly affecting these orexin neurons and the gene expression of those neurons, meaning we are producing more of them. So overall, our entire signals within our body are be awake, and it probably comes from a little bit of like a survival thing. You're not eating, stay awake, okay? Don't, don't go to sleep, you need to go find food, right? So it plays a big role. The next one, is going to be a little bit of diarrhea when you fast, which again sounds weird because why would you get diarrhea when you're not consuming anything? Well, there's something called the migrating motor complex. The migrating motor complex is where your gut actually starts increasing motility as you stop eating. I've explained it like this before in other videos, but imagine you have an office building and when everyone's at work at the office building, the janitors can't come in and clean. But once everyone goes home, the janitors can come in and clean. That's kind of what's going on with your gut. When you're constantly having food coming in, there's not an opportunity to clean. But when you actually go, oh man, this person's gone 24 hours without eating. Hey, we can finally get to scrubbing the nooks and crannies of these intestines. They start cleaning it up and that triggers what's called the migrating motor complex. It actually gets these vibrations and undulations going to move particles and waste out. So it's not that uncommon to all of a sudden have a random loose bowel movement while you are, I shouldn't say totally random. I mean, you'll know it's coming. You're not just walking down the street. But it's a little bit random considering you haven't eaten anything, right? Hopefully I made you laugh, I made myself laugh. But anyway, moving on to the next one. Another common one, and this happens with intermittent fasting too, but it's getting cold. 
Now, some people chalk it up to just the metabolism, right? Metabolism is slowing down because you're fasting, but that's actually inaccurate. The metabolism is actually activating more. And studies have demonstrated that during a fast, because of the increase in catecholamines like epinephrine, norepinephrine, all that stuff, we actually have an increase in our metabolism. So it's not that. What it is, it, this is somewhat speculation because there's not a lot of concrete details on it, but it's so common. It's usually the fact that your body is shifting into utilizing different fat stores. Okay, so what happens then is your brown fat becomes a little less activated during a fast, and that's usually what's providing some thermogenic effect. Now, there's also some evidence that shows that brown fat activates more, but what that means is that you're actually browning white fat. So you're turning white fat that doesn't have thermogenic properties into brown fat, which does have thermogenic properties. But during the actual course of the fast, you are tapping into more of that white fat to actually use for fuel. The bottom line is that's pretty common and that actually means that you're getting into a good stage of a fast. So it can be a little bit difficult. So I usually recommend just sipping on some like warm cinnamon tea. It helps lower the cortisol levels, get something warm, warm the cockles of your heart a little bit, feel a little bit better. Another one that's super important, uh, loss of libido is pretty normal. Okay, And a lot of times you can have a loss of libido that carries over for a day or two after a prolonged fast. With women, you see a decline in luteinizing hormone, which can absolutely affect your cycle, absolutely affect things. Not necessarily negatively, but if you have a decline in luteinizing hormone or a decrease in it, yeah, you can expect some weird changes and a lot of times a loss in libido. But for men, it's a lot more prevalent. You have a short, acute drop in testosterone. Okay, it is not, from a biological sense, does not make sense to wanna go like spreading your seed all over the place when you're starving, right? It doesn't make sense. Like you're, you're starving, you're not exactly in reproduction mode. So totally normal and to be you know, expected. But shortly upon breaking your fast, you might see a nice surge in libido because all of a sudden your body's like, oh wow, this is the one time you actually ate. If we're going to reproduce, we're going to reproduce now. So you get all these signals that are going. So it's pretty common to see those big undulations here. And the last thing that I really want to make sure people are aware of, it's a little bit more niched, is if you have any hint of gout or think that you might have gout, you may want to really be careful. There's a study that was published in the journal Metabolism that found that serum levels of uric acid increased markedly in subjects that were fasting, that were doing longer fasts. Now it's crazy because you would normally think that that comes from eating red meat, and, stuff, and it does. But okay, if you have these higher levels of uric acid and you have gout or you think you have gout, then you might start to feel it enhance a little bit more during a fast, in which case maybe you should stick to shorter intermittent fasting. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. Don't forget to check out our sponsor element down below in the description, and I will see you soon.